This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Deva You place the relic on the ancient altar. At last, the Wand of Orcus will be destroyed, and your quest will be over. As you utter the prayer of summoning, a shaft of golden sunlight cuts through the dust. A single horn sounds seemingly from everywhere around you, and then another, and another joining together in a great fanfare. A shining figure descends from above, a perfectly sculpted humanoid nine feet tall and surrounded by a nearly blinding radiance. A deva. His golden wings do not move as he descends. It's as if he's being lowered on a rope. You have done well, mortal, he intones in several voices, all speaking at once. The deva raises his great golden mace to shatter the evil scepter once and for all. Here's an interesting question. What is a monster? Okay, maybe that's too broad. What is a monster in Dungeons & Dragons? It's actually quite interesting to note that, despite the fact that every edition of Dungeons & Dragons includes a book flagrantly boasting the title of Monster Manual or something similar, only one of those books actually bothers to define the term. According to the advanced Dungeons & Dragons first edition monster manual by E. Gary Gygax himself, the word monster has two meanings. The second, according to Gygax, is the usual meaning, a horrible or wicked creature of some sort. The first meaning, though, is unique to Dungeons & Dragons. A monster is any creature encountered by the heroes of the game, be it hostile or not, be it human, humanoid, or beast, until the players determine what the heck it is and what the heck to do about it, or to it. In other words, a monster is literally anything in the game that isn't driven by a player character. And that definition sufficed until around the fourth edition. In an episode of the D&D podcast prior to the release of 4th edition, James Wyatt revealed that one of the goals for the new Monster Manual would be to economize a bit. They wanted to remove all of the things from the Monster Manual that weren't actually going to put up a fight against the heroes of the game. The game's designers just didn't see the need for including anything in the Monster Manual that wouldn't ever need combat statistics. And that way... They include more combatants. Put in those words, that seemed reasonable enough. But that proclamation, especially when paired with the revelation that metallic dragons would not appear in the new monster manual, upset a lot of fans of D&D. They misinterpreted the whole thing as meaning that there would be no good aligned monsters in the game. Which turned out to be untrue. C. Alongside all of the normal beasts and goblins and giants and dragons and demons and devils, D&D had a tradition of including all sorts of extra planar creatures, including angels. In 1982, three creatures appeared in Dragon Magazine. The Astral Deva, the Monadic Deva, and the Movanic Deva. They were basically angels, you know beatific winged humanoid creatures of good, basically the opposite of devils, and they made their way into the Monster Manual 2 in 1983. And, just like the devils did, they too disappeared from the second edition of the game during the religious and moral backlash of the mid-1980s against D&D. But don't worry, this is not just a retelling of that story. After all, Our episode on Malabranche hasn't gone anywhere. Feel free to give it a listen. Instead, this is a story about the interesting parallel between Gary Gygax's twofold definition of monsters and a particular creature that went from monster 
to hero to monster again, the Deva, because monstrousness is in the eye of the beholder. First of all, note our particular pronunciation of the name Deva. Pronunciations in D&D are always tricky. You only ever see these words written down, and if you don't know which words come from things, like Malabranche and Deva, and which ones are just made up gibberish, like Bullywug and the Bulette, you have no idea whether there are official pronunciations or whether you can invent your own. But Deva is a real word. It comes from Sanskrit, and it means divine, heavenly, and virtuous. And it also may just be the origin of the word devil. Interesting, no? The story is summed up best by Carl Sagan. Yes, that's right. Carl Sagan, astrophysicist and author. He best explained one theory for the origin of the name devil in his fantastic 1985 sci-fi novel about first contact with extraterrestrials and about the nature of science and faith and how they can be reconciled, Indian physicist Devi Sukhavati explains the idea of the Devas for which she is named. The Devis were divine beings who conquered the Asuras or Titans, standard good versus evil type stuff, at least if you were a Hindu. But if you were a Persian, an invader from the Middle East, you worshipped beings of pure good called Ahuras, and the Ahuras defeated the Deva. As Dr. Sukhavati notes in Contact, depending on which side of the Kurthar Mountains one lives on, the Devas are either God or the Devil. But that's not the only ambiguity surrounding the Devas, and I should point out that Deva is the masculine form, and Devai is the feminine form. What's interesting is that the Devas and the Asuras make an appearance not just in Hinduism, but also in Buddhism. And the Devas in Buddhism also aren't quite as fantastic as Hinduism makes them out. But that's because Buddhism actually grew out of Hinduism. And they have many similarities, but they also have a few key differences. Hinduism is a complex religion that still predominates much of India. It is believed to be more than 5,000 years old, but because it began with oral traditions, the first written records of it appear around 1700 BCE. Those written records were the Vedas, ancient religious scriptures that are divided into four broad collections, the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajur Veda, and the Atharva Veda. But Hinduism is tough to explain or define because it is an extremely broad religion and was the result of the merging of numerous cultures. And one of the reasons for it being so broad is because it accepts that all religious teachings are probably more or less true and just different expressions or interpretations of the same basic universal truths. At the core though, Hinduism is about understanding that the universe is an illusion and that we are constantly reincarnated into this illusion until we can learn to see through it and become one with Brahma, the supreme truth who is often depicted as a deity who is one with everything. So Hinduism is about the goal of self-perfection. Because of this goal, during the Vedic period in India, a period of time that spanned from about 1800 BCE through 500 BCE, a lot of scholars focused a lot of time on understanding the Vedas and the true nature of the universe. And some of them came to some pretty interesting conclusions. Among them was Siddhartha Gautama, also known as the Buddha. The Buddha taught that life is not just an illusion, it is essential suffering. Basically, we are shackled to a great wheel, the wheel of life, karma, by our inability to rise above three basic desires, greed, anger, and lust. And it is not just us. Everything is shackled to this wheel. The Asuras, the Titans, they are driven by violence, envy, and jealousy of the Devas. The Devas? Sure, they seem happy enough, 
But the truth is, they are too wrapped up in their own lusts and appetites to see that even they are trapped in the illusion. Souls, as they die and are reborn, migrate around the wheel through six different realms, driven by their karma, basically their failings. The Devas are obsessed with their own pleasure. The Asuras are violent and envious. The beasts of the animal realm can't rise above basic instincts like survival. Those in the Hell realm are anchored by terror and despair, and those in the Pratas realm are trapped by their compulsions, addictions, and appetites. And, of course, there is the human realm, where we are held back by ignorance, but where we are most likely to rise above our failings and escape the wheel. Unlike Hinduism, in Buddhism, the ultimate purpose is to become nothing. Once you shed your desires and escape the illusion of the world, you reach nirvana, a state of non-being, where there is no suffering. So, in a sense, Buddhism claims that even Hinduism is an illusion and that the devas are unworthy of worship. No being is really worthy of worship because they are all part of the same grand illusion, this same cycle of suffering. So, depending on where you look, the word deva can be a divinely good figure, a nasty devil, or a sort of spiritual mirage. And even in D&D, its status as a monster has been somewhat changeable. Let's go back to AD&D 2nd edition. Just as the devils disappeared and then later reappeared as the Beatazu, so too did angels disappear and reappear as Aasimon. Celestial beings of the good aligned planes of existence. And when the Planescape campaign setting appeared for 2nd edition, one of the revelations it held was that there were a bunch of people living in the outer planes, the divine realms of the gods. Not souls consigned to their last rest or final punishment, just dudes and dudettes trying to make their way in a supernatural cosmos. And that raised the question of what happened when a dude or a dudette produced a little dude or dudette with a devil or a demon or an angel. Sorry, with a Bayadazu, a Tanari, or an Ayasaman. And that introduced the idea of the plane touched. Tiflings were the result of demon or devil blood in the family line. They were part demon, basically, and it manifested in minor physical and magical attributes. No two Tiflings looked alike. One might have horns, one might have a tail, one might smell of brimstone, one might spoil milk and scare animals. One might be hot to the touch. They were all different, and the same held true for angelic blood. If you had an angelic ancestor, you were an Asimar. When 4th edition finally came out, Tiflings appeared as a core, playable race. They had grown in popularity through 2nd and 3rd edition and finally earned a coveted spot in the player's handbook. But, as part of the economization and streamlining of 4e, their backgrounds were rewritten. All Tiflings looked basically the same, and they were all descendants of humans who had reneged on a deal with the devil and been transformed as part of the breach of contract lawsuit. But what about the Asimar? What about the Deva? Interesting that they were missing. Actually, Chris Perkins wrote about it in a sidebar in one of the 4E preview books, and he called it the Ave Maria problem. Once upon a time, Disney had done this movie called Fantasia, the original one, not the remake. It was basically just a bunch of animated sequences inspired by classical music pieces. One sequence was based on Mussorgsky's Night on Bald Mountain. And man, was it awesome. It had devils and monsters and fire and lightning, and it rocked. Another was based on Schubert's Ave Maria. And it was boring. I mean, Ave Maria is a wonderful piece of music, and it has become inextricably tied to Christianity, even though it wasn't written as a prayer originally. 
The animation had these candle-carrying monks winding slowly across the dark landscape. I think. I don't really remember. It wasn't really all that memorable. And that, according to Perkins, was the Ave Maria problem. Evil is always cooler than good. So when the time came to develop the races for fourth edition, they had lots of great ideas for Tiflings. Tiflings were easy to write, and they were awesome and metal, but ideas for good roles for Asimar in the world of D&D were kind of thin on the ground. So they got left out, at least at first. When the Player's Handbook 2 came out, the Aasimar were back. Actually, they were called Deva. In 4e, the Deva were a race of beings that had been created as servitors to the gods and had once lived in the divine realms. But through countless ages of being reborn, they had lost their memories of that life and that place. Now, they live as flesh and blood mortals, fighting off the corruption that threatens their very souls. And when they die, Deva are reborn into a new life, with only vague memories of what came before. Does any of that sound familiar? This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com. 